Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for rejoining us after uh, lunch for uh, B-Sides Boulder. So we've had a little bit of a change of schedule. Uh, unfortunately, one of our speakers went um, a little bit AWOL uh, this afternoon. Um, no worry, though, because we have um, somebody else actually um, here to uh, deliver a short talk. Um, so uh, today we're going to actually be having James um, or Punk Coder, if you're in the um, Discord channel, um, presenting um, a talk that he's done a few times before. I've seen it. It's wonderful um, on uh, encryption for developers and what you need to know about encryption um, as somebody who's uh, writing code potentially. Um, to give a little bit of background, James is a uh, developer and security advocate whose biggest responsibility is leading developer security practices. He sets the standards and procedures for how the practice operates, leads all client engagement efforts with regard to security. He also takes the lead in making sure that company staff, developers specifically, are properly trained and following best practices with regard to application security. So with that, I'll let you take it away, James. Fantastic. All right. So let's go ahead and start up the presentation and get a quick confirmation that you all can see this. Yep. Looks great. All right. Fantastic. Today, we're going to talk about encryption for developers or everything that you wanted to know about cryptography, but were afraid to ask. And really, you know, a little bit about me. I, you know, I'm do developer security. I sit on the orange team for Tremble. Um, I have a MCPD e, MCPD EA as well as a CISSP. I still try to do coding on a regular basis and I do a lot of speaking. Uh, I think the next one that's coming up after this one uh, will be Nebraska code here in a couple months. So let's talk about crypto. And whenever I say crypto, I mean cryptography, not cryptocurrency. So hold tight. We've got a lot of stuff that we are gonna cover in a very, very short period of time. Um, if there are any questions, I will be more than happy to take some uh, questions in the Discord channel following this. But for the moment, let's go ahead and dive right in. Okay, so starting off, if you've got no idea what cryptography is, what it is, simply put, is the art of using mathematics to keep secrets secret. Um, we're going to use different various functions to produce a system that is very easy for some people to get the information out if they've got the key or hidden away for people who don't. So um, why should developers care about it? And furthermore, why should secure, uh, security professionals care that developers care about it? Well, many of the failures in security come from ignorance about cryptography. We saw a great example earlier today where you know, we're doing these kind of secure communications across, across student software, but there's no security to protect that messaging going back and forth. Um, you know, the second part of that is improperly used cryptographies, almost as bad as having no crypto at all. Um, and we'll see some examples of this here in a little bit. Um, the majority of information that developers know about cryptography is given to them really fourth or fifth hand. Um, so in most cases, your developers are getting told basically like, you know, you need to do encryption at rest. And then the person who's telling them that walks away. Okay. Um, and the second part of this really goes down to where, okay, so if we aren't educating them as security professionals, where are they getting this information from? And generally speaking, they're getting it from Stack Overflow. And as we all know, Stack Overflow does some really bad stuff with cryptography. Now, information exchange, completely different. Uh, situation. They do a fantastic job of doing it and explaining it at such an academic level that it's almost impossible for a developer to consume. So let's take a look at kind of that base portion of it and really dig into this subject. Okay. So a couple things to handle first. Encoding. Encoding is not encryption. Um, and we see this used in places that is kind of ridiculous that we're still seeing this. Um, you know, Kubernetes secrets, Docker secrets are still encoded using base 64. There's no, no actual protection there. You know, um, encryption really is the process of producing unreadable text through the use of keys. And then hashing is a one way function where we can feed something in it, it becomes almost impossible to get it back out. Save, for example, with the use of rainbow tables. Okay. 
So here's an example of the kind of stuff that you see as an AppSec person looking into this. Um, so whenever we tell the developer, we say, hey, you should definitely salt and hash your passwords. Um, and so this developer, and this came out of real code that I saw as part of a review, um, they did exactly what they were told to. They salted and hashed the password. Um, but there's a huge number of problems with this code. First of all, we've got, you know, we're running it through one iteration of SHA-1. The salt is static salt. And we're not sprinkling the salt in, we're just appending it to the end. So we've got a lot of things that are wrong with this in this space. So one of the key pieces, if you take away nothing else from this conversation, I want you to take away these four things. These are the four good ways, the four only acceptable ways to store passwords, okay? And we'll dig into these as we go. First one is the password-based key derivation function two or PD, uh, PBKDF2. So an impossible acronym that goes into this and it really goes through and it produces this process of doing the password and all this. And so we've got the various pieces in here, uh, the PRF, which is usually a hashed HMAC, it's built in. Um, we've got the password that we're supplying. We're including some salt that's cryptographically random. And the key here is we have to remember that it's cryptographically random. So as a developer, you can't just go out to do the random library. You actually have to go out and do the cryptographically strong random salt, okay? Then we've got the number of iterations we go. The key to this is the more iterations we're doing, the better. And the key to this is the last one is the derivation and derived key length. And this is what the end byproduct is. Um, and we want to make this sufficiently long so that we don't accidentally run into collisions. Now, where does password-based key derivation function really shine? It shines in areas where we've got um, kind of constrained environments for processing because uh, this particular function doesn't use a lot of CPU to go through and pull these pieces out. It actually functions very quickly. Um, so it makes it more uh, applicable for things like use in the cloud um, for you know cloud-based applications um, as compared to some of the items that we'll get and talk to. Now, the high point of this is also kind of the low point, right? Because this is such a um, intent, uh, password kind of non-intensive function, it means that we can more easily spin up things to try and defeat it. We'll take more, a look at that more in the future. The next one up is bcrypt. Um, this is a password derivation function using Blowfish that's memory locked. So the key here is as we start stepping down through this, you're gonna start seeing ways that we lock this down. And the further that we lock it down, we're making it dependent on something on the system. And so from an attack standpoint, what that's doing is it's actually making it more difficult because the ability to go through and brute force this now requires some combination of resources to produce a single output. And that's really what we're looking for here. So we've got bcrypt, it goes through, we have cost, um, salt and password, right? Pretty simple stuff. Key is, is that we wanna make sure the we have the max number of iterations that we can that makes sense for your space. Now. Where this is going to be, and you're going to see this, is if you've got this on a device that's maybe uh, memory constraint, that will work out really well because it helps to break it uh, or helps to keep it structured in a mobile device or something like that. Um, if you put this into the cloud, it will also function very well. The trick is, is that you're going to have to make sure that you have enough memory to cover the number of people who are going to try and log in or register as part of the process. S-Crypt. Very similar place, except for now we're not just locking to memory, but we're also locking to CPU. And that's key because the further we go up this change chain, the more difficult it is for an attacker to go through and try and brute force those passwords. And so we've got this, we've got our password, we've got our salt, we've got the cost, which is a way for us to balance the CPU versus memory cost as part of this, our block size, our parallelization factor, or how many CPUs do we have to set off or threads do we have to set off to be able to calculate this process. And then finally, the output key length. The last one that we're going to talk to, this is the way you should be doing it. And I say this because whenever we take a look at the numbers of what it takes to process, we will see that this drops down significantly and makes our application significantly more secure, especially when we're talking about the password portion of it. So, 
Argon 2 comes in a couple of different flavors. The one we're really going to want to dive into is Argon 2i, uh, sorry, 2ID. And it really locks it down to memory, execution time, and parallelism lock as far as we go across this. Okay. So what does this look like? If we take, you know, a simple laptop that you can go and buy at Best Buy um, and actually run the numbers through this. Doing the first example that we saw of our developer, you know, we see that there's, you know, 38,000 mega hashes, okay? That's a lot of processing power. We can chunk through those password lists very quickly to test them. But the further we go down through this, once we get the password-based key derivation function, we're down to hundreds. Bcrypt has us in the hundreds. Scrypt has us in the thousands of kilohashes. When we drop down to Argon2, we are in the thousands of hashes. That is a significantly more structured way to handle this. Currently, as far as I uh, understand, there is no way to speed up an Argon2 ID hash breaking process with uh, accelerated graphics cards and things like that. Okay, but at the end of the day, encryption is only as good as your keys. So make sure that you're protecting them accordingly. Great example of this is the Capital One hack. And we saw this a couple of years back, but effectively what happened is we had old credentials on a WAF that allowed to pivot into an ET, uh, EC2 instance, then switch and use that lateral movement to gain access to the metadata service. If you are storing the keys for your encryption right next to where you are storing the data that is encrypted, you are going to have a bad time. This is gonna end very poorly for you. The end result, they were able to say, okay, well, we've got an encrypted bucket here. We've got your encryption keys here. Well, I'll just clone the buckets and unencrypt them and then siphon off the data, okay? So the first part we're gonna talk about for this is symmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption really refers to the ability to communicate encrypted using a single shared key. Now, this works really well in the situation where you don't actually have to share that key. If you've got inherent knowledge of it, um, that works really well because if I'm encrypting something for myself, I don't have to worry about that key leaking. Uh, so going back in time, the first one we're going to talk about really here is Lucifer. Lucifer is DES. If you, and I'm not going to go into a whole bunch about this, but if you see DES in code base, you need to run as a developer. This is a horrible thing you'll see. And it's um, implementations of it get really, really strange. I've seen uh, DES implemented on Android devices. And if you are a pen tester and you see DES implemented on a uh, Android device or on a, an IoT device, you are in luck because you have the the world is open to you. Um, because the key is only 48 bits, you can easily brute force it in a very, very short amount of time. Okay. We go through, I talked a little bit about Des. Um, was fully broken in 1999. You can uh, hit the entire space in 22 uh, hours and 15 minutes. At this point, it's not even that long. Okay. Um, triple des. If we go through and we see triple des in code, we need to start extracting it. It's considered extremely weak since the entire calculated key set fits into a one terabyte drive. Okay. The RC family. Now this is kind of mixed back and forth and there's problems with uh, these because they're actually licensed technology. Um, some of the attacks that we see against WEP are based off of these the fact that these individual cryptographic algorithms are no longer strong. Um, so the RC family, you got to be kind of careful with how you use it. But here is the key. If you're writing code and you are setting up applications that you want to be secure and you need a strong symmetric key, AES is your winner. Yeah. Comes in block sizes of 128, 192, or 256 blocks bits. As part of this, you will need to specify an initialization vector. This is a uh, matrix of values that allows it to start randomly at a various point and then do the decryption or do the encryption so that whenever you encrypt the same value multiple times, you get random data out. Now, one of the interesting things that I've seen developers do is if they don't understand how the initialization vector works, they'll use iv.none. 
And what that means is it turns the initialization vector into a bunch of zeros. So you will get the same data every single time. And whenever you do that, it allows the attacker the ability to start guessing at some of the stuff um, as we will see here in a few minutes, okay? So whenever we talk about AES, there are five modes that we have. We have electronic codebook method, cipher blockchaining, cipher feedback, output feedback, and counter. And these all have individual uses as part of this. Um, electronic codebook is the main one that we'll talk about as kind of being weak because it's severely weak. And essentially what it does is it encrypts a block of text using the same key the same way every single time. This should not be used for anything but the absolute smallest of messages, okay? Uh, Cypher blockchaining works really well if you are doing encryption in a way where you need to do random seeking. And because the way that it's set up is the encryption portion of it is single threaded, which means as you're writing, it is slow to write, but can be read fast and can be uh, randomly uh, moved to a random point if you know where in the memory you wanna go. Cypher feedback can't be paralyzed. The decryption of it, however, can be. So whenever we're going, this is another one where we can go through and allow random seeking as part of this process. Last one is encryption uh, output feedback, which means we're taking the output of each block and moving it into the next one as we're going along. This means that you have, uh, if at some point portion of the message is captured, if it does not have the information that came before it, it is absolutely worthless. So if you've got long living streams of data where you have to have these pieces in place, you can use these tools to get through it. Does not allow for random reads or writes. And the last one is counter. Um, this encryption method works well in situations where you have to have fast write, fast read and can be used to paralyze the data across multiple threads, allowing you to get those random reads. Okay. Um, here's the reason we don't use electronic codebook mode. If we have, for example, a password that goes through here, and we notice if we change just that very S in the very, very middle from an uppercase to the lowercase, we see something very interesting happen. Um, on both sides of that block that has changed, we have the exact same values. Now, as an attacker, you can go through and you can see this information um, in such a way that you can actually go and if I only need to modify a certain portion of it, I can try and take guesses of it and pull from something that I know to be good and stick it into those blocks. And I may get lucky enough to get stuff to work. Okay. One quick second. All right, so now we're moving on to asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption is the situation where we need to have two different people who have a secret and don't want to share their secrets with other people to get their first secret back and forth. I guess that makes sense. Um, think of this like a mailbox. So the idea is, is that whenever I want to send something to somebody, I take it and I wrap it up in an envelope that has that person's name on it. And I take it and I stick it in the mailbox. Now, theoretically, once it gets to the other end, the only person who can legally open that is Bob because Bob's name is on that envelope. We do the similar thing, but it's just with math, right? So the idea is that whenever I send Bob a message, I'm going to encrypt it with Bob's public key and the text that I want to send it to him. He gets cipher text. In order for Bob to decrypt that, he needs the cipher text and his private key, as well as his password to unlock that private key. So this all was made possible through the use, uh, through the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And if you haven't uh, ever had really a good dive into this, um, you should definitely take a look at it. There's thousands of videos on online that do a far better job than I will do in the short amount of time that I have to talk to you. Um, but it's a way for us to exchange information back and forth between two people without giving up a secret. And is fundamentally the basis for most of as uh, asymmetric encryption. Okay. So RSA, RSA is 
fundamentally what we know across the board, mostly as the mainly used asymmetric encryption algorithm. It relies on the fact that we that factoring very, very large primes is challenging. Um, because of this, the process of generating these keys is very slow, it requires a lot of entropy in order to do that. Entropy being the, uh, the randomness assigned to it. Um, and so there are some places if you have to generate large amounts of, uh, of RSA keys, then you'll need to offload some of that functionality to something like a hardware security module in order to make that work. But the key is here was what we're looking for. Um, the bit rates that are associated with it are important for us to understand how secure something will be going as we move into the future, okay? Um, right now, a 256-bit RSA token can be broken in about 35 minutes. Uh, 124 is still the minimum considered to be secure. That's really starting to fade out. Generally speaking, 2048 is the space where most people consider the trade-off between the time to use it as well as the time to generate it is kind of the good point. It gives you a decent amount of security. But if you're looking at forward secure, uh, forward privacy, making something secure in the future, 4096 is where you want to go. Um, whenever we talk about quantum encrypt, uh, quantum functionality breaking cryptography, this is what they're talking about. Because fundamentally, quantum affects the ability for us to, to factor large primes and because of that, that presents that weakness to us, okay? Um, there is an interesting piece that we need to step out of here. There is an Oracle attack that goes into this called OAEP, is the codebook issue that relates to RSA. I'm not gonna dive into it here. There are lots of great videos, but if this is something that um, you're looking at, it's definitely worth diving into. Um, the next one that we talk about is elliptic curve. An elliptic curve really does a good job of generating some very, very secure, very fast public-private key cryptography. Now, there's a huge caveat here. Due to the fact that some of the curves that were introduced by the United States government are considered weak, um, you need to stay clear of certain of them. Now, whether they are actually weak or not, that's questionable. Um, but the perception is, is that if you're in this situation, you probably just want to avoid them altogether. Um, these are also potentially weakened through the future of quantum computing, um, but there are some things that people are doing to tweak that to make it a little bit more secure. Okay, here are the weak elliptic curves that you should generally avoid. Um, again, there's a lot of political reasons about this, especially if you're dealing with certain other countries that you'll want to avoid them just so you don't have to answer questions more than anything else. Okay. Cryptography, and I'll cover this super quick, um, and the quantum threat. This has been a hot topic for a lot of years going forward. Um, in reality, it's not really that big of a deal. We've known that this is the quantum edge has been coming since the 1970s. People have been working to do some really good research to keep this kind of at bay. Um, and some of the algorithms that we've had have been around for 20 plus years, really being beaten on them and moving them to the next level. Um, if you want to, kind of defect, uh, protect yourself against this. We've got uh, perfect forward secrecy. Um, the openquantumsafe.org has a fantastic set of tools that are built into open SSL with newer versions that allow you to integrate uh, lattice and other types of quantum resistant cryptography, which will give you an additional uh, secrecy going forward. So if you have to worry about your data being lost over a long period of time, and with that, that's it. I hope you had a good time. I hope I gave you enough information for you to go off and kind of find new stuff. Um, if there are any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them in the channel. Thank you.